Welcome back to the EM Ottawa video series. This is Toxicology 3.4. In this segment, we will discuss the approach and management of tricyclic antidepressants and toxic alcohols. Please ensure you have reviewed 3.1 and 3.2 video prior to this. First, we will discuss tricyclic antidepressants or TCAs. TCAs include medications such as imitriptyline or imipramine. They are mostly used to treat anxiety and other psychiatric illnesses. TCA overdose have a few different effects on the body. Their main toxicity affects neurological and cardiovascular system. In the neurological system, it causes altered mental status and seizures. In the cardiovascular system, it causes tachycardia, hypotension, it impedes the conduction system and causes arrhythmia. For diagnosis of TCA overdose, like with any other overdose, being able to pinpoint the time and the amount of ingestion is very helpful. You would also want to see whether this was an intentional overdose or not, and to see if the patient was and still is suicidal. In terms of lab diagnosis, we would obtain routine lab work. We might throw in other serum levels of medication that we think the patient might have taken, such as Tylenol or aspirin. TCAs do not have a specific serum level test. What's interesting about TCA toxicity is that the ECG rather than lab test can give us a lot of clues. In fact, the sicker the patient, the more abnormalities we will find on the ECG. Well, let's see what they are. As mentioned before, TCA causes tachycardia. So we first look at the rhythm. We often find the patients are tachycardic. If you start to see AV block, then the patient is sicker. We then measure the QRS interval. An interval more than 100 milliseconds means the patient is sick. They likely will develop life-threatening arrhythmia and or seizures. The longer the QRS interval, the sicker the patient is. We also look for prolonged QT interval. Again, the longer the QT interval, the more likely arrhythmias will develop. Treatment for TCA toxicity, like other toxicities, start with supportive treatment. We ensure that the airway is patent, that the breathing is supported for oxygenation and ventilation. And because the patient is often hypotensive, we often have to give lots of IV fluids to support the circulation. There is a specific treatment for TCA. It is sodium bicarbonate, just like the one we used in aspirin overdose as we described in the last video. In patients who have long QRS interval, arrhythmia or hypotension after fluids, we give sodium bicarb. If the patients are seizing, benzodiazepines such as lorazepam or diazepam will be used. To summarize, the TCA acts on neurological system and cardiovascular system. We do an ECG to look for arrhythmia, prolonged QRS interval, and prolonged QT. The sicker the patient, the longer the QRS interval will be. We use bicarbonate for sick patients and benzodiazepines for seizures. Next, we will discuss toxic alcohols. There are two specific ones we are interested in, methanol and ethylene glycol. 
These two toxic alcohols share some very interesting common properties. The parent compounds, the alcohols themselves, are not toxic. When they're in the bloodstream, when you measure a serum osmolality, that will be increased based on the parent compounds. As our body tries to metabolize these two alcohol, they become acids. These acids are toxic to the body. These toxic acids do not cause a high serum osmolality. They do, however, cause an anion gap, metabolic acidosis. This is important in how we treat patients who have a toxic alcohol ingestion. We will discuss these two alcohols separately and then return to their management. Methanol is also known as wood alcohol. It can be an unfortunate adulterant in homemade wines. Methanol, again, is not toxic to the body. However, as we are trying to metabolize it, it is converted into formic acid. That is the toxic acid. Formic acid is toxic to the eyes and the brain. It causes blindness by attacking the optic nerve. It also causes altered mental status, ataxia, and seizures. Ethylene glycol is in radiator fluids and in certain windshield washer fluids. It is broken down into oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is toxic to the kidneys. Now we'll discuss the diagnosis and management of these toxic alcohol ingestion. For the history, it is again helpful if you can find a time frame of ingestion, how much is ingested. Depending on the concentration of solution, even 50 cc can be fatal. Again, the reason behind the ingestion is important. Also, if it's possible, you should try to obtain the original container. On physical examination, patients who have toxic alcohol ingestion often will be breathing quickly to compensate for their metabolic acidosis. Methanol toxic patients might have decreased visual acuity or change in mental status or even frank seizures. For lab diagnosis, Remember that these parent compounds will cause high serum osmolality. Therefore, in addition to routine blood tests, we should get a serum osmo level. As these compounds get converted into toxic acids, you should also see an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And therefore, a blood gas is helpful. Let's say we have a patient who have ingested ethylene glycol. Their blood gas might come back looking like this. Often the pH is low because the patient is acidotic and is acidotic because their bicarb is low, leading to a metabolic cause for acidosis. In order to compensate for this metabolic acidosis, the patient will try to blow off their CO2 leading to a low PCO2 as well. The next step is try to calculate the serum osmo gap. How do we do that again? That's right. You first start by calculating what is the expected osmolality by sodium, urea, and glucose that comes back from your blood test. Let's say these are the values we're getting from a blood test, and therefore your expected serum osmo should be 300. And then what you do is you take the measure osmo that you actually measure from the serum. Let's say in this case is 340. And now the gap is between these two, and therefore there's a gap of 40. 
When you have a metabolic acidosis and an increased osmol gap, you will want to obtain the level of the toxic alcohol. You do this by asking for a toxic alcohol level or fractionated alcohol level. And you can ask for both ethylene glycol and methanol. In this case, the ethylene glycol level comes back as 40, matching the osmol gap that you have by calculation. That would fit a patient who has ingested ethylene glycol. The treatment for toxic alcohol, as you might have deduced, is not to let the body metabolize it at all. Since the parent compounds are fairly non-toxic to the body, well, how do we not let the body metabolize these compounds? We try to block the metabolism by blocking the enzyme that metabolizes these toxic alcohol. This enzyme is called alcohol dehydrogenase. If we can block this enzyme from working, the parent compounds would just be excreted from the body unchanged. How do we do that? There are two ways of blocking the enzyme. One, ethanol is a very good competitor for this enzyme. If there's ethanol around, this enzyme would preferentially bind to ethanol rather than either ethylene glycol or methanol. We therefore sometimes order an ethanol infusion for these patients. Number two, a newer medication known as promipazole deactivates the same enzyme, leading to the same effects. After we manage to block the enzymes, we also want to get rid of the toxic compounds. We do this by hemodialysis. If we can get to the patients before they start to convert the parent compounds into the toxic acids, sometimes hemodialysis is not being carried out. This is the time we always want to speak to a nephrologist. In summary, methanol affects the eyes and the brain. Ethylene glycol affects the kidneys. The parent compound causes increased osmo gap. while the toxic metabolites cause an anion gap metabolic acidosis. To treat this toxic alcohol ingestion, we block the enzymes, and that's done by using ethanol or formepazole. Toxic metabolites are removed by using hemodialysis. We hope you enjoyed this toxicology segment. Thank you for watching.